Internet-based technologies that they are pioneering, such as blogs, wikis, voice over internet protocol, podcasting, filtering, sharing, social searching, and social bookmarking with some nice on-the-ground cogent examples and public accomplishments to point at and publicly praise, such as Skype, Wikipedia, Katrina List, Flickr. So far, so good. However, there is room for verbal improvement here. Now, if you are a professor of the English language, who also happens to be technically aware, such as Alan Liu, oh, yes. You can find that Tim O'Reilly sentence to be rather problematic. Why? Because it's not language-centric. It's too much of a techie banner ad. It's also too hasty. It is half-baked and lacks proper historical seasoning. And it's not social, economic, political, or cultural in its assessments. I will quote Alan Liu, author of The Laws of Cool, from a recent interview he did. I am highly skeptical of the Web 2.0 hype. There are two reasons for this. One goes back to the issue of history. Web 2.0 is all about a generational change in the history of the web, but from a perspective that is looking at what is happening right now, as opposed to what was happening during the previous generational change of the 1980s. It is not clear that we can really describe a generational change of this magnitude and complexity while we are in the midst of the change itself, except to say that something is happening that a future generation may decide is qualitatively different. After all, when people speak of Web 2.0, they are actually referring to a swarm of many kinds of new technologies and developments that are not all necessarily proceeding in the same direction, for example, toward decentralization, open content creation and editing, web as service, Ajax, etc. Okay, I think Professor Liu has a point here. A wagon train of pioneers on the electronic frontier, they are not the same thing as a town. And Alan Yu goes on about the serious semantic problems of simply not knowing yet what we are talking about and even tripping up on some obvious philosophical contradictions. He says, it is not at all certain, for example, that open content platforms in the style of blogs, wikis, and content management systems align with the philosophy of decentralized or distributed control, since many such database or XML-driven technologies require a priesthood of back-end and middleware coders. That would be you a priesthood of back-end and middleware coders to create the underlying systems and templates for the new, quote, open, unquote, communications. Just how many people in the world, that would be you, just how many people in the world, for example, can make one of the current generation of open source content management systems, which often start out as blog engines, and make them do anything that isn't on the model of post or category or chronological posting. Even the more trivial exercise of reskinning such systems with a fresh template requires a level of CSS knowledge that is not natural to the user base. <laughs> so what is Professor Liu trying to say here, not particularly clearly? Basically, he's saying that in the guise of empowering users through all this participatory foo-for-a, Web 2.0 is actually a ploy to return the Internet's technical power to the specialized geek clique that originally built Web 1.0. They stole our revolution, now we're stealing it back. <laughs> and selling it to Yahoo! <laughs> and Alan Liu has even more to complain about. My second reason for being skeptical about Web 2.0, at least the hype about it, is more important. I think that people who make a big deal out of Web 2.0 are trying to take a shortcut to get out of needing to understand the real generational changes that are happening in the background that underlie any change in the web. Those changes occur in social, economic, political, and cultural institutions. 
Web 2.0 is just a high-tech set of Waldo gloves or remote manipulators that tries to tap into the underlying social and cultural changes but really requires the complement of disciplined sociological, communicational, cognitive, visual, textual, and other kinds of study that can get us closer to the actual phenomena. I don't think there are many developers of Web 2.0 technologies. That would be you who have done the hard social and cultural studies to help them think about what they are developing. They make a neat system or interface that only taps into some aspects of the social scene. Then, if there are a lot of hits or users, their system is said to be a paradigm. But it's hit or miss. There is no assurance that such technologies are the real best, coolest, or even the most useful face or book or space of people, only that they are the face, book or space allowed to surface through a particular lash up of technologies. Now, I have my differences with Alan Liu, just like I do with Adam Greenfield. Because I'm a big cyberpunk postmodernist cynic, I don't think there ever comes any time when we get a full social, economic, political, and cultural assessment of a technology. The telegraph is dead. You can't send a telegram in the United States anymore, but the historical jury is still out on what telegraphs and telegrams really did to us. One of the best books we have on this subject is a book called The Victorian Internet which just gives up and tries to recast that historical experience with the words we're using now. I do, however, entirely agree with Alan Liu that Web 2.0 is a lash-up of technologies that is made in a big hurry by catch-as-catch-can hacker types. That might even be considered its virtue. The deeper problem is that language is a lash-up, too. We don't get some red-hot tech lab separated from a cool and contemplative ivory tower where we get to make permanent historical judgments. We're lucky nowadays just to get theory objects, which are electronic lash-ups of data, ideas, and weird riffing. A theory object is kind of hack for English majors. Now, why do I go on about this? Because it really matters. It's a serious part of the work of emerging technology. It's like naming and christening the baby. It's not the sex or the pregnancy that create and grow the baby. It is the verbal incantation that turns the baby into a social actor. Now that we gave her a name, Victoria, now she is a legal person. So now she can be tagged, ranked, searched, and sorted. <laughs> and what is the victory condition? It's in the reaction of the public. It starts like this. I've got no idea what he is talking about. And then it moves smoothly straight through to, oh, good Lord, not that again. That is the most boring, everyday thing in the world. That is the victory, to make completely new concepts that become everyday, obvious, boring. Okay, enough words for a second. Let's try another picture. Before you start getting all weird and ludic with ubiquitous computation and digital tags for objects, I would suggest reading Simpson Garfinkel. Who knows what he's talking about, technically speaking? My book, Shaping Things, that's a cultural manifesto. It's a visionary polemic. This book, RFID Application, Security, and Privacy, this crams a lot of soothsayers between the same set of covers. So, you know, go read the tech manual before you blow off your own thumbs. Here's another useful picture. This is a film of printed RFIDs. I apologize for having made you look at so many book covers. This, this image, this technology, very elegant, soothing, designery looking, also very threatening in many interesting ways. So we will leave this image up for a while now. Back to the grind of the words. <laughs>